I'm Natalie Billingham, Senior Vice President of Sales at Akamai and EMEA MD, and I want to welcome you to this edition of Your On Mute. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Tarika Barrett, the CEO of Girls Who Code, as our guest. With a career dedicated to addressing the inequities in education and helping young women of all backgrounds succeed, Dr. Tarika Barrett is at the forefront of expanding the pipeline of women entering tech and removing the obstacles which stand in the way of them achieving their full potential. As the CEO of Girls Who Code, an international nonprofit organization that's helped over 450,000 students to date, she spearheads initiatives aimed at closing the gender gap by equipping, inspiring, and educating young women with computing skills that will enable them to pursue 21st century roles. As the CEO, she's focused on creating greater opportunities for women in STEM and advancing the ambitious goal of closing the gender gap for entry-level tech roles by 2030. So welcome, Tarika. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. So today, we're going to talk about the role of mentoring in creating and driving success. We know that diversity matters and that we know that companies and societies flourish when we create safe spaces for all and when we listen to and appreciate the wide range of human experience. However, within the tech industry, we've made slow progress and there's still a long way to go if tech companies are gonna more accurately represent the communities that they serve. That's why today, Tariko and I are going to be discussing what companies can do to promote diversity. And in this episode, we'll be looking at the crucial role that mentoring can play in the development, attraction of talent and progression. We'll also be looking at the importance of women role models and their visibility within the workplace. After all, you can't be what you can't see. So again, welcome to Rika and let's uh, get into the questions. The first of which is around mentoring itself. You know, why is mentoring so effective and why is it so important within underrepresented groups? Natalie, thank you so much for that introduction and, you know, for this uh, question because it's such an important one. I guess I want to start out by just talking a little bit about, you know, how I've experienced this. Growing up, you know, my challenges weren't so different from other folks coming from working class immigrant families who were walking the line between two cultures. But what I think actually set me apart is that I considered my journey one of tremendous support. And that's why I always encourage people to seek out mentors and role models in school and at work. And it's why one of the core values at Girls Who Code and our programming is actually sisterhood and why we've begun our own virtual mentoring program for our older students. Connecting people from marginalized groups with mentors can reap benefits that last throughout an entire career. It gives people a clearer picture of what they want to do with their careers, understand how they're actually going to get there, and it helps them get the resources they actually need to succeed. Most importantly, collaborative relationships are essential to helping people build confidence in their abilities, and they also provide the support networks to help them actually persist in the face of discrimination. The work to tackle something as vast and systemic as a gender gap in tech is far less daunting when you actually have peers and role models on your side. I love that idea of, you know, as being a, a sort of support group for each other. And certainly it sounds like at Girls Who Code, you've got a proven way to do that. So what advice do you have for companies who want to embrace uh, mentoring within their workforce? Yeah, so for companies that actually want to embrace mentoring, they can start by creating intentional mentoring programs within their teams and not rely on these relationships building organically. And this is especially important for entry-level women in tech who are the most likely to fall out of the pipeline early in their careers. We did a recent study and confirmed that 50% of women end up leaving the tech industry before the age of 35. So these are mentoring programs that have to be built with trust and accountability in mind, allowing people to speak freely about the issues they face without fear of retribution and with constructive feedback to help them succeed. 
And when I add that that same study also confirmed that many women left the tech industry because they lacked female role models. We can't encourage young women to persist through the tech industry if the mentors they seek out, those with similar life experiences as them, don't exist in the higher ranks at tech companies. At Girls Who Code, we always say that you can't be what you can't see. And Natalie, you pointed that out. Companies need to look deeply at their own leadership and practices to create meaningful diversity across all levels of the workforce, from entry level to the C-suite. That has to be the first step in creating mentorship opportunities that actually have a real impact on bettering the experience of marginalized groups in tech. And you know that that study that you refer to and that stat is really very sobering. You know, I think fifty percent of women there, and and we, you know, through the You're on Mute series, have actually talked a lot about the role of women in the workplace and how the hybrid workplace, place, uh, you know, potentially impacts women or provides opportunities in some cases. Uh, but in this case, uh, thinking about the virtual workplace and how this plays into that. You know, what tips do you have for people who want to undertake mentoring virtually? Because it's a slightly different world, isn't it? Yeah, you know, at Girls Who Code, we found that there are actually so many benefits to creating virtual mentorship programs and so many benefits to virtual programs in general. Having a virtual, flexible environment has allowed our mentoring programs to serve more people. It's allowed for our participants to grow their professional networks in bigger and better ways. But I understand that not everyone is as comfortable connecting virtually as they are in person, and that some of these important conversation topics can easily get left behind. And that's why we also recommend that people implement systems that work for their own needs. Icebreaker questions, a designated venting session, a clear agenda that's decided on beforehand. All of these are great tactics to make the process more organic. Everyone is different and everyone has different needs when it comes to mentoring. However, we know that virtual meetings aren't going anywhere. So it's still important for people to create strategies that make them work for themselves. When we decided to look at virtual programs as an opportunity rather than a hindrance to our work, it opened up so many new doors of possibility. And I think looking for the opportunity is so critical. And so I really appreciate the the sort of way that you've approached that, both for companies that can take this opportunity through mentoring and for individuals on how they manage it through some really nice tangible tips that they can utilise in their own day to day. So it seems like support and collaboration underpin both the advice for organisations, which is one aspect that you've really, you know, helped uh, companies think about how they pursue mentoring differently, and for individuals with some really tangible tips that they can take forward in their own potentially virtual mentoring world. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Tarika Barrett. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Natalie. A pleasure. And appreciate the time of everyone who's listened. So as always with your on mute, if you have enjoyed uh, what you've watched today, please do feel free to like or share. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>